You know, several years ago, uh, a group of people from our church uh, teamed up to produce a short film for the Kamloops Film Festival. Uh, the film was entitled uh, Forget Me Not. Forget Me Not. It was a short, short film. And, and I just really wish someday they'd be able to produce this, the full version of this film because I think it's something that encourages every young adult and every young person in this community. In the short, short version of the film, one can quickly pick up the message that one decision, yes, this one decision, especially one of the bad decisions, can have devastating results for so many, many people. That's why the full version of the film is entitled Ripples. Ripples. Yes, one decision, whether good or bad, can have a rippling effect on so many people. You know, as I uh, reflected on the, the content of the short short, it, it so keenly made me aware of the dangers of kind of the teenage, young adult party scene. I mean, you get excessive alcohol, plus the availability of the day grade drug, and throw in men without a moral compass, and you've got a recipe for disaster. Tragically, friends, sexual assault it is a real problem in North America today. Yes, a problem in our very own city. In the summer of months, an article came out in Kansas this week that TRU creates a task force. And the reason TRU created this task force was to address the issue of sexual assault on campus. Christine Adams, the Dean of Students at TRU, said a firm policy will be in place sometime next year, including a booklet that they're going to give out to every new student and every faculty at the school on an annual basis. Christine Adams was also quoted as saying in this article, it's one of the most underreported crimes there is. Four or five weeks later, I pick up a copy of the National Geographic magazine, October 2015. The article I was looking at featured Jimmy Carter, former president of the United States. He served USA between 1977 and 1981. And then in 1982, him and his wife, Rosalind, started the Carter Foundation to address global issues. And they've done so much terrific humanitarian work. But in this article, Jimmy said, if I could do just one more thing, and by the way, he's 90 years old and battling cancer right now, but he still wants to make a difference. And he says, if I could do one, one more thing, he says, I would like to address, try to in some way address, the horrible abuse of women and girls around the world. Some 70% of people sold across international borders are females, and yes, they're being sold into sexual slavery. <laughs> Furthermore, Carter said this, and I, I have this quote here for you this morning. It, it just kind of shocked me when I saw this. One out of five college freshman girls can expect to be sexually assaulted in some way before they graduate. This crime is seldom investigated in our country, and it also exists in our military. You know, I, I have to conclude that many, many North American men have a problem with expressing their sexuality in a healthy way. Or should I say, globally, men too all, all often, or all too often have a problem of expressing their sexuality in a healthy way. Friends, I know there's a huge difference between sexual assault and other forms of inappropriate sex. I, I, so I believe it's so important for us to hear what God has to say about healthy sexuality. Sexuality can be described by three words, holy, honorable, and pleasing to God. So I'm gonna ask you to open your Bibles here this morning to 1 Thessalonians chapter four. 1 Thessalonians chapter four, and if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, go to your bulletin, and you'll see a hand up there with the text in full. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, we read, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, or literally, siblings, <laughs> siblings in Christ, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. In verse 1, we see Paul acknowledging the fact 
that the Thessalonian church in northern Greece in the first century were really doing quite well. They were living a life pleasing to God. Nevertheless, Paul thought it necessary, it's necessary to ask them and urge them, hey, could you do it even more? You know, I think Apostle Paul is kind of like a good coach. I think he's kind of like Pete Carroll of the Seattle Seahawks. Although maybe this year is a little exception. But he catches his team doing what is right and says, you're executing the game plan. Now do it more and more. I like that. Now, based on verse 1, I think we should also conclude that it's actually possible to live a life pleasing to God. I like to put it this way. I think it's possible for all of us to live under the smile of God. Now, keep in mind, I am not talking about earning God's acceptance here. For we're just like the Thessalonian church. We have been called by grace. We have been saved by grace. We have been forgiven by grace. And now, in response to all the grace that God has shown us, we want to live a life pleasing to Him. Friends, Christian living is always a response to what God has done for us in Christ. Christian living has nothing about earning God's acceptance. We're simply seeking to respond to Him for all the love He has shown to us in Christ. And I should add, friends, that the Apostle Paul's philosophy of life is so incredibly simple. He says the goal of Christian life is simply to please God. Or as he says elsewhere, and I like how he puts it in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, when he says this, we make it our goal to please him, whether at home in the body, in other words, alive, or away from it, at home with the Lord. What a simple yet profound way to live. It's much like that bracelet young people wore over the years, and maybe some adults did too. What would Jesus do? Paul simply got up every day and asked himself the question, Lord, what would please you today? And it was obviously something that the church in Thessalonica was doing really well. Now, in verse 2, Paul says that the instructions he gave the church on how to please God were not based on his authority. And I think we should understand that. The instructions he gave here on how to please God were not based on his authority, but rather on the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one whom we read has all authority on heaven and earth. So in other words, when Jesus speaks, we better listen. Now, in verse 3, Paul gets more specific on what exactly pleases God, what it looks like. And here we go in verse 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. Let me stop right there. Paul couldn't be clearer. A life that pleases God is a holy life. And I understand this word holy is, is kind of a mixed up term. We're not talking about holier than thou, I can sure tell you that. That's just the opposite of a holy life. A holy life is a humble life, a grateful life, a godly life. So we have this word here, sanctified, and it means holy. But let me tell you what, let me flesh it out a little bit for you. Really, to be sanctified is to be set apart and to begin the process of reflecting the character of God. And friends, to me, that's downright exciting. That the purpose of your life, the calling upon your life, is actually to reflect God's character. Like, is our life better than that? I don't think so. Now, in the latter part of this verse, we read that you should avoid sexual immorality. Yes, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. In other words, here's what holiness looks like in practical terms. It's about avoiding sexual immorality. Now this word sexual immorality is found some 39 times in our New Testament. And it's a very, very broad term that's used to describe all forms of illicit sexual behavior, including premarital and extramarital sex. When it comes to expressing ourselves sexually, the Bible is very clear. Sex was designed by God to be expressed and enjoyed within the context of a committed relationship. But I have to ask myself, why would Paul remind them of this when in fact he's already told the church, hey, you're living a life pleasing to God, now just do it more and more. And I think the simple answer to that question is this. It was the context in which the church in Thessalonica lived. 
One Old Testament classical scholar named William Barclay, and he writes such great stuff. He says, there was never an age when marriage vows were so readily disregarded. In support of this command, or this, this quote, or excuse me, in, in support of this comment, Barclay quotes a first century fellow by the name of Demosthenes, something like that. And he says this, it's, it's really an amazing quote in, in the horrific sense of the term. We keep prostitutes for our pleasure, we keep mistresses for the day-to-day -day needs of the body, and we keep wives for the begetting of children and for faithful guardianship of the home. There's a first century writer. How low can you get? Furthermore, friends, the town of Corinth, from which Paul wrote his letter to the church of Thessalonica, was synonymous with promiscuity. They had this great temple there, pagan temple in Corinth, where there was a thousand prostitutes working out. It's no wonder Paul thought it necessary to encourage these people to avoid sexual immorality. It was part of their culture. And friends, it is not his warning to them as timely and as relevant to us as it was 2,000 years ago? I, I really believe so. An article in Reader's Digest recently said, well actually a few years ago said, one out of every two marriages will be affected by an affair. I'm also informed that 60% or more of teenagers usually are involved sexually before 20. Furthermore, we live in a sex saturated society. And I guess this was driven home to me today, this week by an article someone sent me. <clears throat> Did you guys know that Playboy magazine will cease, the, will cease the publication of nude photographs of women in this magazine? And you have to say, wow, they've had a change of heart. They're moving in the right direction. Well, not really. They haven't changed their opinion at all. But here's what Scott Flanders says. He's the CEO of Playboy today. Here's what he says. He told the media that his product had been overtaken by the larger culture. You're just one click away from every sex act imaginable for free. The fact that that company, that magazine may eventually go out of business, friends, is not good news. Friends, pornography is so destructive. I'm sure it's contributing to sexual assault in our society today. I'm sure it's contributing to broken marriages, to unhealthy views of sexuality, and furthermore, the idolization of sex. Furthermore, in the words of Mark Gunger, that you laugh your way through a better marriage, he says this, pornography overstimulates males, and they don't need any further stimulation. I don't know if you've seen Laugh Your Way Through a Better Marriage, but it has this giant chart. And on this chart he says, now uh, a male sex drive, it peaks when he's 18 years old. So it goes like this. And now here's how it goes for the next, well, he starts drawing a line. And he's trying to draw it a little bit lower, but basically it's a straight line. And then it gets over here, and then he dies. <laughs> so, <laughs> It was pretty funny to watch Mark, he's a comedian, act this out. But more significantly, friends, pornography robs a wife of being her husband's one and only. That is what women truly want. They, they want to know that their husband has eyes for them only. That in their heart, they're loving them and them alone. And friends, I must say this, in addition to pornography, our culture has so many films and TV shows and books and music and even theater that distorts God's wonderful gift of sex. And therefore, I conclude we too need to hear what Paul has to say about healthy sexuality. Yes, we need to have clear and strong convictions as to what is right and what is wrong, because if there's fuzzy thinking in our hearts and our minds, we'll be extremely vulnerable, and we're all vulnerable enough already. Let me tell you a story. About 37 years ago, I was attending Seattle Pacific University as a third year student. I had someone from my junior college days write me. She was attending a very elite school with people who were really, really smart in the state of Oregon. And, and she wrote me the letter and said, Harry, you know, hey, what are your views on premarital sex? Because at this school, it really feels like everyone's involved. So I began to dialogue with her through uh, letters in those days, no email in that time. 
to simply say what I believe the Bible had to say about premarital sex. In addition, I began to discover that there were a lot of articles out there on the topic. Articles by journalists, psychologists, counselors, doctors, pastors, philosophers, etc. You know, before long, I had a file like it was this thick with all these articles. And I want to tell you, if you'd like to have a summary, a summary of all those articles, I have a document on this table here that summarizes at least 13 reasons why God would really want you to keep sex within the marriage context. Furthermore, on the back side of that handout, there's another handout that was part of the school, Surrey School District in the 1980s, and basically it was an abstinence program, and, and they gave teenagers, you might say, really creative responses if they found them in a situation where they were feeling pressured into sex. I'll just read a couple of them to you. When someone says to you, teenagers, everyone is doing it, the response, a good response would be, well, I'm not everybody, I'm me. Besides, I don't really believe everybody is doing it. I think it's a lot of talk. Here's another one. If you love me, you'll have sex with me. Well, a good reply is this. If you love me, you'll respect my feelings and not be push, push me into doing something I'm not ready for. Anyways, if you'd like to copy of those that are on that communion table. Friends, let me just summarize uh, what I discovered in my limited research on this topic and other ethical issues. First of all, God commands us to do something because it's really in our best interest. He also asks us to avoid certain things because he knows it's also in our best interest to avoid certain things. God is no cosmic killjoy. He is our loving creator who knows what is truly, truly best for us. In regards to sex, God says it's a beautiful gift designed for a husband and wife in the context of marriage. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. And may this gift nourish your relationship. Now back to the passage before us this morning. Friends, in many ways, the issue of holiness, or the issue of sexual purity, comes down to this. <coughs> Will we learn to control our passion? Will we let our passions, or will we let our passions control us? Look with me at verses 4 and 5. That each of you should learn to control, in other words, it's a possibility, your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. In other words, friends, we have a choice. We do not have to be controlled by what Paul calls passionate lust, or any desire that's not healthy. I think on a fairly regular basis, you guys deny yourself. You wake up in the morning and say, I don't feel like going to work today. But you know what? You get out of bed and you go anyway. You go to school. I don't feel like writing this paper on a Friday evening. You do it anyways. We, we have to live that way. We can't follow every desire within us. Our world is going to chaos, friends. We have a choice. We can learn to control our passions in a way that is holy and honorable. Furthermore, and I think this is such good news, friends, we have all the resources in the world to live this way. And our primary resource, friends, is the presence of a person in our life called the Holy Spirit. We have all the resources we need. I'll say more about this in closing. Paul now moves on and gives us four reasons why we should avoid sexual immorality. Reasons that are far more important, I want to say, than the reasons I have on these handouts in front of me here this morning. I'm going to have to move quickly. Every one of these reasons could be a message in itself, but here we go. Reason number one is found in the first part of verse six, which reads, and that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. I spend time with people who've been taken advantage of. I see their tears. I still feel their pain. Friends, sexual immorality is an offense against another human being. You know, when a married person is involved with someone outside of their marriage, they, they hurt the trust and the security and the intimacy that they enjoy with their spouse. And they also run the risk of destroying a marriage or two. Furthermore, when a single person is involved with someone before marriage, 
they run the risk of not being able to give that wonderful gift of virginity to their spouse. And I know, you know, when you're a teen, you think that first person you meet, ah, I'm going to marry this person. Well, you know what? Most teenage romances dwindle up, and they're not the person you marry. Reason number two. Sexual immorality, friends, is to be avoided because it's a sin that God will judge. Oh, believe me, it's not the only sin he will judge. But look with me at the last part of this verse here. He obviously did some teaching in Thessalonica on this. He says, the Lord will punish all such sins as we've already told you and warned you. <coughs> According to the Bible, sin is something that needs to be confessed, turned from. It's something we ask God for forgiveness for. It's not something we're to hold on to. It sits under the judgment of God. Third, we should avoid sexual immorality because, and this is so important, it's a violation of our calling. For God did not call us to live, to be impure, but to live a holy life. I like that. He's called us to something so much better than just following passionate lust. He's called us to a life of reflecting Christ, the character of Christ. That is an awesome, awesome calling, friends. Fourthly, we should avoid sexual immorality because, and this is the most important reason of all, failure to do so when you know better is to reject God. Therefore, he rejects this instruction, does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. You know, to ignore what God has to say about how we express ourselves sexually is not to disobey your parents. Not primarily about rejecting your parents. Let me put it that way. It's not primarily about reject, rejecting maybe a youth group leader or dear friends or your own conscience or your church. It's primarily about rejecting God. It's about rejecting the one who loves you most. It's the one who invented sex in the first place and who knows how it works. Admittedly, friends, the passage before us this morning has a fair bit of oughtness. In fact, a lot of oughtness. But I would argue some real good and healthy oughtness. Let me summarize. The passage before us teaches us that we should live a life pleasing to God. That's the big idea of this passage of Scripture. Something this church, the fellow believers, should focus on because of the way God has loved us in Christ. Friends, may we all join Paul in saying, we make it our goal to please him. In this regard, I like what Thomas Constable has to say. Everyone lives to please someone. Himself, his spouse, his parents, his child, his God, or something, one else. For Paul, well, he focused on pleasing God as his motivation for Christian living. Furthermore, he did not see the Christian life as a set of rules to be obeyed or a list of prohibitions to be avoided, but rather a life aimed at pleasing the one who really loved him most. And I think we should understand that, that Christian living, that Christian ethics should really spring from a loving relationship, not simply a list of rules over here. Living to please God, friends, is the big idea in this passage. But secondly, this passage teaches us that we can please God through holy living. Christians are called to live a holy life. And it's not simply about being separated from certain evil activities, but more positively, it's about being set apart to reflect the character of God. That is a wonderful, wonderful calling, friends. It's life at its best. When you're reflecting kindness, and temperance, and grace. You're, you're living life at its very, very best. Thirdly, this passage teaches us that avoiding sexual immorality is an example of what holy living is all about. For the married person, this means being sexually faithful to one's spouse. It also means treating your spouse with respect and love. And that rules out selfish sexual demands. Think of that old song by the Temptations, My Girl. When we went on a road trip this summer, we bought some old music from the past, and the Temptations had this song called uh, My Girl. Huh. 
I think that song conveys what God's heart is for the men who are married. May you always see your wife as my girl. In fact, Grant reminded me of that this Sunday morning. I mean, Thursday morning, he said to me, do you remember what you said, Grant? I just love being on a holiday in New York with my girl. I love that. For the single person, friends, it means abstinence before marriage. Therefore, the sexual energy that seems to rage in youth and never ceases until you die, man, needs to be redirected both into caring relationship with friends of both sexes and in loving service to others. You know, 17 years ago, almost to the day, we asked the young people at Summit Drive Church to sign a card which read, Believing that true love waits, I make a commitment to God, myself, my family, my friends, and my future children to be sexually abstinent from this day forward or until the day I enter a biblical relationship. You know, I think 15 or 20 teens signed the card that Sunday. That's a long time ago. And I guess it's my prayer that every single person here today would live out the spirit of that commitment. Fourthly, before us this morning, friends, this passage teaches us that all the above is possible because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Did you catch the last phrase of this passage? The very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Wow. According to the Bible, friends, one particular virtue that springs from being filled with the Spirit is this, self-control. No one can live life successfully without self-control. Some people maybe learn it through being raised really well in a really healthy family, but we have the Holy Spirit in addition to that to enable us to live out sexual restraint. To once again quote Thomas Constable, the very indwelling Holy Spirit has power enough to enable any Christian to learn to control his own body, even in a pagan, immoral climate. Friends, we should be so incredibly grateful for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, a final word. I think what this passage teaches us is incredibly, incredibly difficult. Both because of the culture in which we find ourselves, and because of our own inclination to do what simply pleases us. Furthermore, it's so very difficult because Jesus says to us, if you even look at a woman lustfully, you have already committed adultery with her in your heart. In other words, Jesus raises the bar on sexual purity to a level that the vast majority of human beings have to say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. And the reality is this, if this is not your particular temptation, another sin is. So I say, friends, it's so very important for us to read today's passage in light of God's greater story. In fact, we need to read every passage of scripture in light of God's greater story. And what is this greater story? That he sent his son to this planet, making the forgiveness of sins possible. Yes, God forgives us through faith in what Jesus did for us on the cross. And it's by grace, it's a free gift to all who believe. Last week, our guest speaker, our guest preacher, Harold Weiss, spoke to us on the topic of grace. And in fact, he called grace downright scandalous. Because it's offered to those who have been dreadfully evil. And as Harold said, and I really kind of chuckled when he said it, uh, we're really quite comfortable with God forgiving people who sin up to the level that we have sinned. But we can't limit God, friends. And we usually underestimate our own sinfulness, by the way. <laughs> friends, God's grace is always greater than anyone's sin. He forgives people like Adolf Hitler, like Jeffrey Dahmer, and I quiver when I say his name. Or may I add to this list, the person who wrote the passage we're looking at today, the Apostle Paul. Remember what he said about himself? I'm the worst of all sinners. Wow. Friends, apply to the topic before us this morning. Yes, to all of us who have violated the clear instructions of this passage, 
whether in fact or whether in thought. God forgives us by his grace. And yes, here's the scandalous part of it, friends. God even forgives those who've been involved in such things as sexual assault. If they but come to him, confess their sin, and ask for his forgiveness. Friends, grace is scandalous, or put positively, it's truly, truly amazing. And let us never forget that his grace is not just about forgiveness. His grace is also about enabling us to do the right thing. He gives us his enabling grace so that we can actually live a life pleasing to him, so that we can actually live a holy life, so that we can actually express our sexuality in, in a loving, healthy, and respectful manner. Friends, let's depend on him from this day forward. Let's depend on him to give us the grace to live out our sexuality in a really, really healthy way. Have, have a person you can talk to and pray together about this. We want to really think healthy, of, in a healthy way about this wonderful gift that God has given, not just to the church, but to all of mankind. Friends, this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. I'm gonna ask you to stand at this time and worship team to come back. And uh, I'm gonna close in our worship song here today.